Welcome back to part three of the STEMI discussion on ischemia injury and infarct as it shows up on a 12 lead uh, electrocardiogram. And in this discussion, we're going to talk more about STEMI. Uh, to review 12 leads and test your knowledge on this, of course, you can find 12 leads anywhere, but there will be subsequent videos uh, showing you different forms of ischemia, injury, infarct, and even STE mimics. And then you'd have to decide, just like you would in real time, whether you believe it's a STE mimic or a STEMI. So we should probably review uh, what reciprocal changes are because most of your STEMI criteria might not include reciprocal changes. However, uh, that is kind of a good indication that you're dealing with a STEMI versus an STE mimic. And it could be difficult because you see here that your, your septal and your anterior leads don't have true reciprocal leads. You'd have to do a posterior 12 lead to see those reciprocal changes. Um, however, a lot of those uh, anteroseptal MIs are not isolated. They involve some of the lateral wall where you can get some uh, reciprocal changes as they show up in 2, 3 AVF, your inferior leads. And your inferior leads, of course, almost always have some reciprocal changes in, in 1 and AVL, especially AVL, because it's so uh, polar opposite, if you will, uh, in, in its point of view. And then the posterior wall MIs are typically identified first by seeing the reciprocal changes in V1 or V2, and sometimes even V3, V4, uh, and then you would do a posterior 12 lead if it was isolated to a posterior wall, and you know get your V7, V8, V9, and CS the elevation there. And that is a pretty good, in good indication that you have a posterior wall MI. If you have depression in the uh, anteroseptal leads and elevation in your posterior leads, uh, that's that's pretty uh, solid case for a posterior wall MI. Of course, we should talk about uh, how these reciprocal changes show up. And uh, usually, a reciprocal change is going to be ST depression in the leads opposite of those where you see ST elevation. So as I said before, your inferior versus your lateral leads is a, is a great example of that. Here we have an inferior infarct. Okay, In 2, 3, AVF, you have a good amount of J point elevation and ST segment elevation. And then you see in leads 1 and in AVL uh, a good amount of ST depression. These two leads, 3 and AVF, are the most opposite two leads on a 12 EDKG, on a traditional or standard 12 EDKG. And that's why you almost always see reciprocal changes when one of those leads is involved. If you look over here at the precordial leads, all this ST segment depression that you see, what do you think that is? That's not a reciprocal change to the inferior leads. That's actually a reciprocal change to the posterior wall, which is often involved with your inferior wall MIs because of the way coronary circulation works. We know that RCA, the right coronary artery, provides blood flow to the posterior descending artery in 85% of people, so that's most people, obviously. Um, so if you were to have an occlusion of the RCA like you do with your typical inferior wall MI, then it's, there's a good chance that it will involve the posterior blood flow, and that could show up as a posterior wall MI uh, in conjunction with the inferior wall MI. So we talked again about the different parts of the heart, and the one that was just infected there was your inferior wall because of this right coronary artery occlusion, and the posterior wall uh, for the same reason, because it was a dominant RCA that was occluded. So now let's try to identify the different areas of the heart that become infarcted um, by using this little diagram. So we're, what we've basically done is we've taken a slice of the heart, uh, the ventricles of the heart, um, and this is your septum in the middle, and you have your right ventricle and your left ventricle, you know, your right ventricle over here, your left ventricle over here, and... Uh, by looking at it this way, you can identify the different areas that are affected by the different types of myocardial infarctions. So with an anteroseptal wall MI, um, you can see that the septum here is, is, of course, involved. And I've kind of exaggerated the right ventricle because the right ventricle, you know, it, it may come to about here. And a lot of this anterior wall, the left ventricle, will show up on uh, as infarcted as well with these anterior septal wall MIs. So V1, V2, V3, V4 may all show that injury uh, on a 12 EDKG.
and here's your example of uh, b both an anterior anterior and septal wall MI or anterior septal wall MI. You have ST segment elevation that occurs and extends all the way from V1 to V4. Uh, you have a good amount of elevation. And remember, this QRS complex is super small in V4, so that amount of elevation, you know, about three or four millimeters of elevation there, very significant, very significant amount of elevation for that size of QRS complex. And you do see the start of some reciprocal changes over here in the inferior leads, which may indicate that this is going to become, uh, have some lateral wall involvement as well. You could have uh, at just an isolated anterior wall MI that doesn't include the uh, septal wall as well. And, you know, your anterior leads are V3 and V4. Of course, this is the same EKG, uh, but it would simply... And, and for purposes of uh, definition, it's kind of difficult because a lot of times you'll hear uh, uh, physicians, they'll just see ST elevation in all of these precordial leads, and they'll just call it an anterior wall MI. And you'll be like, wait a second, I thought the anterior wall was only V3 and V4. Sure, uh, but that's kind of you know a common clinical definition that we use in the field. They call it an extensive anterior wall MI. Sometimes they'll just say it's an LAD occlusion, you know, because you see ST elevation in all these leads that are, you know, looking at areas of the heart that are fed by that massive uh, left uh, anterior descending coronary artery. So for purposes of this discussion, we are saying V1 and V2 are septal, V3 and V4 are anterior. So this would be considered an anterior septal wall uh, MI based on this 12 lead EKG. Then, of course, you have your lateral wall MI, which can affect this entire lateral wall of the left ventricle. And V5 and V6 are the ones that wrap around that side of the body and get a good uh, angle of view at that low lateral wall. And in your limb leads, with the high lateral wall, uh, myocardial infarction, your uh, you know leads 1 and AVL will have a better angle of view at those. So here's... Uh, a good example of what a lateral wall infarction looks like on a 12 EKG. And this this is more of a low lateral wall. As it becomes a high lateral wall, you might start seeing reciprocal changes, especially in lead 3. You don't see them now because there's no true reciprocal leads to just V5 and V6. And, uh, and, V5, and this is earlier in the injury, it looks like. But that's where you would have the SC segment elevation in V5 and V6. And this is indicative of a left circumflex occlusion because remember that left circumflex is what wraps around that lateral wall and provides most of the blood flow to that area so when it's isolated to just the lateral wall it's a good chance it's a left circumflex occlusion so now we're going to talk about the inferior wall MI and what's important to note here is your inferior leads so this heart that's not how it sits in your body remember it sits a little bit tilted so this becomes kind of the bottom right? And the apex would be really out here. So I'm going to try to just redraw simply kind of how the heart sits. Now I've exaggerated how it sits, but uh, this is again your inferior wall and how your leads look at that is important. So lead two is positive electrode, you know, it's down by your left leg. AVF, if you were to go straight down, uh, you know, from your nose straight down, AVF looks up at the heart from its positive electrode uh, down there. And then three, almost to where your right leg is, if you consider that angle of view, that's kind of how lead three is. And that means that these are your inferior leads because they're all looking up at the bottom of your heart. Okay, they're all looking up at the bottom of your heart. And again, I exaggerated the way the heart lays in there. Uh, but it, you know it's just tilted slightly, so this becomes the inferior wall. In fact, if you look at the way that this heart is drawn here in the middle of this, um, you can see uh, that's kind of how it, it sits inside your body right there. And you see 2, 3, and ABF all have positive electrodes aiming straight up at that inferior wall, you know, and they get a good angle of view at that right ventricle. And here's a typical inferior wall in my pattern. You'll see ST segment elevation. I know it doesn't look too impressive, but you can see it in 2, 3, and AVF here. And as I said before, the second you see ST elevation in 2, 3, AVF, look immediately at AVL. 
And here's why. Look back at these leads. Here's lead three. Here's AVL. That's their positive electrodes. Notice how opposite they are of each other, right? So that means that they are going to show reciprocal changes for the changes that show up in those leads. So AVL um, has a reciprocal change. That is a STEMI. You don't need to go any further. You could go further if you wanted to um, and see that you have ST depression in some of these anteroceptal leads, and that's indicative of a posterior wall infarction because this is a dominant RCA occlusion. And how do I know that it's, it's a right-sided, well, uh, or a, a RCA occlusion? Because the pattern kind of fits that. Your inferior wall is infarcted, not so much of your lateral wall is infarcted, and then you have a posterior descending artery. So it's probably not a left circumflex occlusion. Uh, it's most likely a dominant RCA occlusion. On top of that, we become worried about these uh, inferior wall infarctions because the, uh, the right coronary artery provides so much blood flow to the right ventricle, and they can become hypotense uh, you know, due to, to the lack of blood flow to the, the, that right ventricle and the inability to uh, maintain uh, cardiac output with the amount of preload coming in. So what you're going to want to do is identify whether this is a right-sided MI. And one really simple way to do that that's often overlooked is if you look at lead 3, and lead two. Now going back to this image again, which one is more to the patient's right? This is the patient's right, this is the patient's left. Lead three is obviously more to the patient's right, so it looks more at the right ventricle than lead two does. So going back to the 12 lead, if you have more elevation in lead three, so ST elevation in three is greater than the amount of ST elevation in lead two, that is probably a right ventricular MI. On top of that, you could also take uh, your V3 and V4 electrodes. You've got to get V4, but do V3 and V4, and kind of mirror them on the patient's right side of the body. You're not used to putting 12 lead electrodes over underneath the, the right breast or any of that area, but that's what you're going to do with a right-sided 12 lead, and you'd call that V3R and V4R. You're going to obtain that tracing. Make sure you mark that, those R's, on the, the 12-lead tracing itself. And the QRS complexes are going to change morphology. They'll probably be much smaller. But any degree of elevation with those small QRS complexes is indicative of a right ventricular infarction. And the problem with those right ventricular infarctions is because of the reduced cardiac output, the, the right side of the heart uh, basically becomes a conduit and becomes very preload dependent, very preload dependent. Um, and if you give any nitrates, reducing preload, you can cause them to have severe hypotension. If you do that inadvertently or by mistake, then make sure you give fluids. They respond very well to fluids because you're now increasing preload again. Um, so if you were to give nitrates to a right ventricular infarct and they become hypotense, administer fluids rapidly. Um, and also assessing for uh, you know, signs of cardiogenic shock and uh, pulmonary congestion. So I'm going to talk again about right ventricular infarction. Hypotension is a common assessment finding with right ventricular infarction. Now, most inferior wall MIs involve a good portion of the right ventricle, but not all inferior wall MIs become hypotense. In fact, not all right ventricular infarctions become hypotense. However, you should avoid nitroglycerin or use it very uh, conservatively, um, and fluid should be administered if these patients are unstable. And just repeating what I said before, if there's SC segment elevation in lead 3 that is greater than the amount of SC segment elevation in lead 2, it is very specific for a right ventricular infarction and per pretty sensitive for a right ventricular infarction as well. And just to reiterate, the V3R and V4R, you would take the V3 and V4R electrodes, or V3 and V4 electrodes, and then just move them over to the other side of the patient's chest. And the idea behind that is to get a better angle of view of this right ventricle. And of course, on your 12 EDKG, uh, make sure that you note where uh, you change any of the traditional electrode placement. So if you were to do a, a posterior 12 lead or a right sided 12 lead, make sure you mark that on the 12 lead itself. Let's talk briefly about that posterior wall. Remember, a dominant RCA is when the, the right coronary artery supplies the posterior descending coronary artery with blood flow.
And that's the most common situation in about 85% of people. But a dominant circumflex may exist where that LCX or left circumflex supplies the posterior descending coronary artery with its blood flow, much less common. So if you wanted to do a posterior uh, wall 12 lead or a posterior 12 lead, you're going to take uh, electrodes V4, V5, and V6, and then just continue wrapping them around to the back, basically. So you're going to have your posterior axillary line is where V7 is going to go, and then in, and make that V4, but it's going to be, become v, V7. And then V8 is in that midclavicular line or midscapular line uh, on, on the posterior side of the body. And then V9 is going to be just paraspinal, which means right next to where you can feel the spinal column, um, just uh, medial to V8 on the posterior side of their, uh, that body. On the left, this is the patient's left now that we've turned them around. And then again, make the change on the 12 lead tracing itself. Cross out V4, put V7, cross out uh, V5, and put V8, and then cross out V6, and put V9. And really, I believe that there's only one reason to have to do this to identify the posterior infarction, and, and that is if you see reciprocal changes in V1, V2, or V3, and V4 without any ST elevation over in 2-3 AVF. Most of these patients are going to have an inferior infarction. So you've already called STEMI, you've identified that, and you could, you could assume the posterior involvement based on the reciprocal changes alone. However, if you had isolated, just an isolated posterior wall infarction, which could occur, especially with a more distal occlusion of the RCA, or if they had a dominant left circumflex, you just have the isolated infarction, you would only see uh, potentially the reciprocal changes in those anteroceptal leads so that would clue you in to do a posterior 12 lead. And then now we could call STEMI, activating the cath lab and getting the patient to uh, the definitive care that they actually need. Another 12 lead EKG change worth talking about is Wellens phenomenon. Uh, Wellens phenomenon is a change in the T waves. And one of the more common Wellens patterns is a T wave that is biphasic. It goes up and then down. So you, you, know, you have your QRS. And then your T wave goes up and then down, and, th and that's seen in the anterior leads for the most part, or the precordial leads. Um, you could also just have a deep inverted T wave in, in those precordial leads. If the ECG printout does not read acute MI or, STEM or STEMI, uh, it is highly unlikely that the capture meets STEMI criteria because most 12 lead ECG monitors have, you know, especially modern monitors, if you're using an older monitor, it might not be great. Uh, but uh, most of them have a lot of information input into their interpretive algorithm to identify uh, even very subtle STEMIs. So if you have a nice clean tracing and it doesn't say, you know, with the asterisk, acute MI or STEMI, then you're probably not looking at a STEMI, but there is a chance that you still are. It is possible that the 12 lead is not a true STEMI, even with the acute MI reading. So it could overdiagnose a STEMI, especially in the presence of a poor tracing. So that brings us to uh, the end of this video uh, and, and the end of the overall discussion on ischemia, injury, and infarct uh, as far as the lecture part is concerned. There are going to be subsequent videos. There's also 12 lead ECG case presentations within the YouTube channel, so make sure you check those out. Or you can go back uh, to the previous video uh, and or review any of the ECG videos within the channel.